Hi. Today I'd like to talk to you about how ambiguity can be a surprisingly simple strategy to boost engagement and agency in our students. I want you to picture for me a mindless classroom. This might help. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> I love the movie, but I cringe when I think about the classroom scenes. It's a, it's a pretty good depiction of a sense of mindlessness, kind of going through the motions. The movie is now 31 years old, and despite that span of time, I, I wonder and somewhat worry that some of our kids in our schools are still wearing the faces of Ferris's classmates. So this idea of jumping through hoops and being really compliant, so sitting perhaps outwardly there, but inside being bored and disinterested. So this question of uh, uh, this question of, of engagement versus compliance has been something I've been interested in for a long time. And it's led me recently to kind of investigate this, this uh, topic of agency and some work by uh, Ron Rickhart at Project Zero. And uh, he's, he's involved in cultures of thinking, as well as a psychologist named Ellen Langer. And what these guys have been looking into is how language, and a particular type of language, conditional language, can be a trigger for a more mindful response to ideas and information. Langer talks about what, what happens to our brains when we hear information and ideas presented using conditional language. It introduces ambiguity, it introduces doubt, and it's that Cognitive dissonance that is the thing that I'm excited about that, as teachers, we can bring into our own classrooms. So what it does when we hear information presented in that way is it delays closure and it also invites perspective taking. So why are we not uh, seeing this in our classrooms and our schools all the time? Well, perhaps one theory is that as teachers, we're real experts at chunking information, at surveying a field and finding out what are the key things that we want to deliver to our students and share with them. And inadvertently, we can present that information using absolute language. When you contrast that to the way we think about truth and about how knowledge and information is, is, uh, is discovered, think about scientists they hold truth a little bit more lightly. So instead of uh, saying, here we are, we've found this, uh, this out in this particular context, they'll say it's probably true in this context. An example of that is Pluto. When I was in school, Pluto was a planet. And then new information came about from what was studying and all of a sudden, Pluto's no longer a planet. So that idea of holding truth, what is truth, and how it's presented, and, and how we actually uh, think about that. So what does it sound like? Here's some examples for you. One perspective. Some historians think. Typically, it's understood. So the thing about conditional language is once you start to clue into it, you start to see it in all sorts of interesting places. So I was at the National Gallery in Victoria uh, over Christmas, and I found this lovely guy. He's a, a griffin, uh, a sculpture by Bruce Armstrong. Have a look at the description that came with it and see if you can pick the conditional language. Just spot them. More than one. When, we, when I was looking at this, I initially only saw one. <laughs> so this idea that it's embedded in very simple things and it invites an alternative perspective taking. Here's another example for you. And have a think about how the absolute question in this example tends to lead students to want to guess what's in the teacher's head compared to opening up a whole lot of other perspectives. 
Okay, so my challenge for you today is to think about, as you go back to your classrooms, how to create a more mindful response in your students by being intentional about the language that you use and practice using conditional language, and you might even see a boost in students' engagement and agency. Thank you.